We train people to perform complicated underwater egress movements. We ask people to confront what can be some pretty primal stuff, fear of darkness, confined spaces, fear of water, and all happening simultaneously. And we take away their ability to see, and it can play a little bit in, into the things that they are afraid of. At Survival Systems USA, SWAT, Coast Guard, and Marine units learn basic steps for underwater survival. The primary tool this custom-built helicopter simulator. But in order to make these passengers safe, they'll be put in danger first. We'll experience what it takes to survive an over-the-water aircraft survival situation, and then we'll take a peek behind the curtain and get an even deeper understanding of what goes into creating and maintaining such a high-stakes training system. This is Damage Control. I'm Albert Bohemier. I'm the founder of Survival Systems, uh, started in 1982. When I was in the military, I was uh, one of my jobs was air crew life support. And I knew that there were many problems with that equipment. And I also knew that the passengers had no training. After I left the military, I was flying to the Arctic and I did attempt to land on top of a mountain, basically crashed. I survived the crash because of my military training and the way I had been drilled into, even though you don't think it's ever going to happen to you, always be prepared to react. I understood from personal experience that unless you're very ready, you may not do the right thing. Bohemia built this simulator so he could provide training for service members, first responders, and others who might experience forced water landings and he built it in such a way that it accurately simulates real danger. Their training is called underwater egress, or simply water egress. The simulator is as realistic as we can make it without actually making it into a helicopter or an aircraft. The mechanisms operate the way that they do on the aircraft, so if a handle spins in the aircraft, the handle will spin inside the simulator. If you fly next to a door that's 22 inches across, the simulator exit for that door will be 22 inches across. So when a student shows up for training, they'll enter the simulator and they'll either be seated next to an exit or they'll be seated one seat or two seats away from an exit. So we have them buckle in, we assume that there's an overwater emergency, they get into a brace position, we have an impact with the surface of the water and subsequent rollover. Through the course of the day, we, we start with baby steps. We work uh, on the easy stuff first, the procedures first, and then we start applying those procedures under more and more complicated scenarios. The, the most common and the biggest mistake that I see people make they try to get that seatbelt off as quickly as possible. When that happens, you lose all reference to the rest of the airframe. It's very easy for a person to become disoriented and end up right side up inside of an upside down aircraft. Proprioceptive disorientation is a factor that impacts a person's ability to perform an underwater egress. It's our awareness of our body position in space. And under those circumstances, it's really difficult to figure out where you are relative to everything else and find the emergency exit. The average person doesn't know exactly where they are until they physically start the process of reorienting themselves. It's a bit like if you don't touch the edge of your bed and the headboard of your bed, you don't know where you are. If all you feel is blankets and sheets. It's the same thing in a helicopter. If you release your seatbelt, you don't know where you exit anymore. This disorientation is one of the first and most critical issues trainees face. The technology they use was designed to guarantee disorientation once you hit the water. 
So we wanted to disorient the average human being 100% of the time. So as you were safely strapped into this machine and you were elevated above the water and we lowered you, we had to continue the speed of descent at the same rate. And whilst we were pulling you on the water and pulling you upside down, we had to make you lose your vision, make you lose your sensory input so that you didn't know anymore whether you're up, down, sideways. And now we can start teaching you, how do I get out of here? There are several factors of disorientation happening simultaneously too, especially in a, in a rollover situation. One, we have visual disorientation. We lose two-thirds of our visual acuity when we're submerged immediately. Color also starts to disappear as you descend through the water column, and red is the first color that disappears. It happens in 10 or 12 or 15 feet or so. And a lot of emergency exits, placards, handles are all marked red, so a person under those circumstances are maybe looking around and they're seeing purple or black or blue. The Survival Systems course retrains the brain to enact a series of simple processes when disoriented and under intense stress. The main things that we recommend that people do to help overcome that are one, to stay in the seatbelt and buckled into your seat uh, as long as possible, because as long as you're buckled into the seat, you know where you are relative to everything else in the aircraft. And that's a good starting point for performing the egress. Secondarily, we recommend using an anatomical reference point to, be, to work our way towards an exit. I would tell people, if you're confused, touch yourself and go, oh, yeah, these are my legs. And if these are my legs, this is where my seat belt is. This is my seat. If my seat is here, this is where my exit is. Ah. Once they jettison the exit, they need to make sure that they have an open exit to find their way out. So they'll grab the frame. Their other hand will come down and work the harness. They'll either spin it or they'll pull the latch and they'll release their harness. Once they've done that, now they can pull themselves out. So the disorientation can continue to affect uh, somebody after they've performed the underwater egress. And we've seen this in the training environment where somebody will pull themselves, clear the exit, and start swimming towards the bottom of the pool. Bohemiae says he felt that disorientation when he crashed, too. During the, the disaster situation, after I crashed, I was completely dysfunctional as a human being. I couldn't think, I could not organize myself. The only way I could come to any type of structured reaction was to write down on my knee pad, I have crashed, I now have to survive, I have to make a plan. So I realized how training and being able to do emergency reaction to a threatening, life-threatening situation, how important it is that you've thought about it. The training he developed depends on the technology underlying it. Albert wanted to be absolutely certain that what he built would put trainees into the correct frame of mind and give them as close to a real experience as possible. He knew that lives depended on it. So it's a, it's a very nice, elegant, integrated system. Crane operator, the divers, the instructors, how they communicate and how they use the safety features that are built into the crane. Things like the redundant wire ropes, the weight of the crane, the emergency stop. They are all a nice integrated system that allows all of the redundancies to make it easy for us to train somebody and not hurt them. They engineered a controllable system that safely emulates a dangerous environment. It also goes back to the classroom discussion with the instructor. Part of what we do, and I think we do it particularly well, is establishing rapport with the students in the classroom to have them come up to you and tell you, as the instructor, I don't know how to swim. Great, we can work with that. I know how to swim, but I am terrified of this. We can work with that. Just have faith in us and get in the simulator the first time. We will walk you through. And I always remember one of the Canadian military air crew who he came and took a course and I was his instructor and he kept jumping out of the simulator. Every time we would call ditching and start lowering the machine, he would jump up. And at one point he got really angry and, and he left the site. He then came back uh, the next day and said, listen, is there anything you can do to help me finish? And we did. We worked with him for almost a whole day until we could get him upside down on the water. He could stop his panic. Four years later, I was training in the pool and this dude came by and stood on the pool deck and, and said, hey, come over. And he said, Al, I just want to thank you, man. You saved my life. My kids have a father because of what you did. And he said, I was hateful. I was hateful to what you did to me in that machine. But he said, only during the final moment of 
death versus life. I understood why you guys designed your machine the way you did and also did the training the way you did. I had to crash to really understand it. Survival Systems has created a safe simulation and detailed system of protocols for one of the most dangerous things that can happen to you in a helicopter. Nothing they do here can prevent emergencies from taking place. But by training for dangerous situations, like ditching a helicopter, escaping an onboard fire, and other worst case scenarios, they're providing helicopter pilots and passengers with tools that might just help them walk away from a disaster.